week, and we voted to expand the church. As you have seen, we have been overflowing lately. Um, this is just a rendition, rendition of what we have in mind. Um, this is a, an overall picture of the front of the church. There'd be a, a porticoche that you could drive under when it's raining um, on, on this side. And uh, the other porticoche would be on a phase two or three, we're, I'm not sure which one it is yet, um, to the gym we, or to the multi-purpose room over here, which would include a gym if we needed it. Um, if you'll go on to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, the existing sanctuary is this uh, center box here um, that uh, says Sanctuary Fellowship Hall. You can kind of see the outlay. Uh, phase one, what we need most right now is sanctuary space. So um, we would uh, add 30 feet to this side of the building and uh, this existing wall would be torn out and the sanctuary chairs would continue around in a, a semicircle here and we hope that it would add about 180 chairs uh, to our sanctuary itself. So that's one of our needs. Another one of our needs is uh, immediate classroom space for our Sabbath schools, and it would provide four additional uh, Sabbath school rooms for our phase one. And then, um, as you know, much needed bathroom space. Uh, and we also would have some ADA um, bathrooms there for our, um, for our phase one. Now phase two, uh, is this multi-purpose room and basically we're adding um, I think uh, 60, 70, 75 feet this way and uh, it would give us uh, some more community services, adventures which are greatly in need too, storage space and workspace for our community services because we have a very active community services uh, department. Um, and then this would be the drive under porta cache and some additional bathrooms for that uh, section too. And then phase three would be uh, adding on to the front of the church here. It would provide uh, more classroom. It would, it would give us a facade on the front that would dress up the uh, front of the church, um, give it some more character. And it would create a, a foyer that would be separate from this area here uh, and the drive under port of shame when it's uh, raining and storming and so forth. More classrooms uh, on the end there. So uh, we voted to do this. Um, and as you know, uh, nothing is done for free these days. Things cost money and they're, they're very expensive. So uh, this gives you a place to put any extra income the Lord's blessed you with. And uh, you can assign it to the building committee and it will go to uh, get us going on this project. Um, so we voted on that this week, last Sunday. And uh, can I hear an amen? Yeah, thank you very much. We need that here. Let me see if there are any other, uh, any other immediate. Um, yeah, April 18th, we have a Country Life uh, softball game. Make sure to be there. It's the best way to get to know people. Uh, if you don't play softball, come and root for somebody. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it and have fun. Uh, with that said, we'll get on with our next mission spotlight. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Uh, I confess during business meeting, I looked up the word protege. It's a new one for me. <laughs> Prophecy spotlight will take just five minutes, maybe six, where we look at the world, but not to look at the world, but in order to look at the world to come in contrast and prepare for the world to come. About 20 years ago, I sat on Old Betsy with my sons. They were one and a half and uh, three or so. They were little boys. And it was 4th of July and they were waving little flags for the parade. And 20 years ago, the thought came to my mind that this party will not last forever. I did not see it coming through a virus. I had more the Jesuits, North Koreans, or Iran in mind. But last 4th of July, I, I, as I drove by, I, no, I pulled over actually into the parking lot. I, I took this fuzzy picture, unbelievable 
United States 4th of July parade canceled. And that's one reason why we're having a quick prophecy spotlights every Sabbath, but I do not want it to be just breaking news what you see all week long. It's worship service, it's Sabbath, and we don't need to regurgitate the news of the world. In fact, this quote really made me ponder this week. I'm still processing how I put prophecy spotlight and, and this quote together. I'll read it briefly. Again, they are brought into a our periodicals, selections, which can be found in other papers and books, which need not be repeated. It costs money to issue these matters that have no bearing on the times or the spiritual interests of our people. Well, Prophecy Spotlight, I'm trying to grab what has bearing on our people and is of spiritual interest. The long accounts of the war can be obtained in any political or daily paper, etc. Your work is to preach the word, the work of keeping before the people the common things transpiring around us. The news of the day is not the work of present truth. Our work is to fill every page of printed matter with spiritual food. That's, I'm, I'm still processing this in, in light of my own prophecy spotlight here. Uh, one item that's been around for quite a while, even Mike Pompeo um, uh, commented on that in 2019, and that is the melting of the Northwestern Passage, uh, north of Alaska, northern side of Russia, which causes rumors of wars. It is changing the geopolitical face of the Earth. Uh, the Russian fleet now has access all the way from Vladivostok on the east side by Japan and then back over to Murmansk in the northern side of Russia and then it is destabilizing uh, the world where it's very cold. Uh, here's just briefly something on the Equality Act. I think we need a lawyer sometime to really explain that and dig into that. Um, this bill that was voted or proposed uh, February 25 this year says, and I went directly to Congress, this bill prohibits discrimination based on orientation and gender identity in areas including public accommodations facilities. Now here's where it hits us institutionally as a church one day soon. Education, federal funding, employment, housing credit, and the jury system. Just think of our college in Keen, if you translate that, what that could mean. The bill expands the definition of public accommodations to include places or establishments that provide exhibitions, recreation, exercise, amusement, gatherings, displays, goods, services, or programs. That's us. Transportation services. The bill allows the Department of Justice to intervene in equal protection actions in federal court on account of orientation or gender identity. Um, I, I'll let you parse this, but this will bite us institutionally one day, big time. Not a comment on his moral life. I'm not dragging him through the mud. Uh, this is a famous apologist, Rabbi Ravi Zacharias. He's passed away now. Um, his goal was to reach the secular mind with philosophical arguments in favor of Christianity, and that is why I'm bringing him up. Uh, his motto was, intellectual objections to Christianity are really a cry of the heart, and the church ought to respond to that. I was never a big follower or fan of Ravi, even though he was very pleasing to listen to, very intellectual, but here's why. Paul, in Acts 17, was on Mars Hill in Athens, talking to a philosophical group, the leaders of the city called the Areopagus, and he used philosophical arguments plus the gospel to reach the secular mind. He from then went to Corinth, and had a change of heart in how to approach people. And we as a church and Christianity always wonder how do we reach the secular mind. Listen to Acts of the Apostles, page 244. Profound insight. And a rebuke to most of us church leaders. 
In preaching the gospel in Corinth, the apostle followed a course different from that which had marked his labors at Athens. While in the latter place he had sought to adopt, adapt his style to the character of his audience, he had met logic with logic, science with science, philosophy with philosophy. That is what Ravi Zacharias did. Okay. As he thought of the time thus spent and realized that his teaching in Athens had been productive of but little fruit, he decided to follow another plan in Corinth in his efforts to arrest the attention of the careless and the indifferent. He determined to avoid elaborate arguments and discussions and not to know anything among the Corinthians save Jesus Christ and him crucified. No, I did not watch the interview, but I'm, I'm bringing this up for a very interesting reason. Some clever reporters asked royal experts. England has royal experts, okay? They follow the royalty and the queen and all that and then comment on that. Now, here's something interesting that happens, and we got to pay attention to that. They asked the royal experts about the interview before the interview took place, as, as a joke, okay? See what the royal experts would say about the interview before the interview took place. Guess what? The experts gave expert opinion about the interview that had not taken place yet. What do you conclude from that? You cannot always trust the experts and you cannot believe everything on the internet. <laughs> Burger King meant well. This is also very interesting for Christians. Uh, it was International Women's Day, Women's Day a few days ago, and Burger King released the following statement. Women belong in the kitchen. Amen? Well, the context, the context is Burger King has an H-E-R uh, program, which stands for, here it comes, Helping Equalize Restaurants. Only 20% of the world's chefs are women. 80% of the top restaurant chefs are men. And Burger King thinks that's not fair. We are going to fund women to make it into the top restaurants of the world. Therefore, women belong in the kitchen. But out of context, that doesn't sound very good in the 21st century, and they had to, of course, take that down. Lesson for us, context is very important. Just a couple more things. This day in history on March 12th, um, this gentleman on the left here, Ignatius of Loyola, was sanctified. He became a saint. He happens to be the founder of the Jesuits. I'll give you just a little insight on why that is a problem. Loyola wanted to organize the Catholic Church against Protestants, and if you read the Great Controversy, there will be a repeat of that in our days before the end. Okay, this is why this is important. Now check this out. The first step with a passed away pope is to beatify him, and then the second step is to canonize him in declaring a saint. A Seventh-day Adventist, listen to this. This is what that means. Beatification is a recognition accorded by the Catholic Church of a deceased person's entrance into heaven and capacity to intercede on behalf of individuals who pray in his or her name. That is spiritualism, okay, flat out. Canonization, declaring a pope who's passed away a saint, is a papal declaration that the Catholic faithful may venerate a particular deceased member of the church. That is veneration of a dead person. Uh, incidentally, in the New Testament, there is no single saint, and they're not dead. Saints are believers who are alive. Uh, this is the one-year anniversary of COVID. So in my last minute here, has this changed your life? Whether the disease or not, just society-wise, Here's my agenda when I look at the last year for 2021. Five points. Number one, 
I need to establish a serious, non-compromised prayer life. Let nothing interfere with that. Number two, I need to study the Bible more than I study any news or any other writing in the world. Number three, I need to take care of my health. The doctor did that this morning. We have, as a church, established eight steps that really help and make a difference in your life. Okay? New start. Number four, people. I need to pay attention to people around me. This is a no order, really. I mean, that's a hierarchy, but the majority of my time is number four. And then number five, we as Seventh-day Adventists have a message called the Three Angels Message, and Revelation 14 is my number one point of study, preparation, contemplation, and sharing right now. And that's my agenda for 2021. Don't forget that this weekend is time change. Tonight or tomorrow morning, you set your clocks one hour forward. So tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. is really 9 a.m., which leads me to my last point. And I covered it up for the sake of the children a little bit. If they can change an hour regularly every year, then somebody can also change a day on God's calendar every week. And one day, that will be the final issue in prophecy. Our Father in heaven, we pray today, as we come here to worship you, that your sweet spirit will speak to the hearts of each individual. And Lord, when we leave this place today, I pray that we will know that we've been in your presence and we will be closer to you than when we came. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Let us sing hymn number 478.
This week we also have something else special, not a baptism this week, uh, but we have a baby dedication. And um, I, while we invite the family up, Ramon and Aaliyah Chavez, Chavez will bring up little Nicholas and uh, the rest of the clan. And I, I'll let you know that um, you, know, you read in your Bibles, there uh, happens often in the Bible, the Old Testament, New Testament, people dedicate or present their children to the Lord. Um, Remember, Samuel was dedicated to the Lord and to, the, to his work there. Jesus' parents brought him to the temple to have him dedicated to the Lord. And if you remember also, there were multiple times when the, in the Bible where the people would bring their children to Jesus to have him bless them and, and ask for their, uh, God's blessings on the children. And so uh, we practice that here also. And I, I'm understanding we have a whole clan here that's been dedicated to the Lord, right? You all remember when you had your dedication? No? <laughs> Yeah, so um, Nicholas probably won't remember his either. Probably. All right, so will Nicholas let me hold him, you think? I, I think so. All right, hey, Nicholas. So we're just going to have a, a, a dedication prayer and, and ask uh, the Lord to be upon this family and, and upon little Nicholas here as he grows up. We also have a special gift for him, and I want this to be shown before we leave. Go ahead and just pull the, the one thing out of there. There's a shirt in there. I want everybody to see this. Nicholas, you're going to like this a lot. All right, I just thought this was really great. It says, if you're going to hold that there. It says, when I grow up, I'm going to be a man of God. How about that? So he'll wear that with pride for many years. <laughs> uh, at this time, though, if you would like to kneel with us, the family, uh, we're going to kneel down and, and pray. Heavenly Father, it is a privilege and a blessing for you to give us the ability to procreate, to have children. Lord, what a responsibility that comes along with it. And not just upon the parents and this family, but on our entire church. You've called each one of us to be accountable for one another and to uh, seek, the, seek to help others to be in your kingdom. And this day, Lord, we want to dedicate Nicholas here to you in your service. And I pray that you'll give the family wisdom as they raise him up. And one day, Lord, this family, along with little Nicholas here, will be in your kingdom. And many other souls through the work that perhaps he does. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, you had enough of me? All right, there you go. All right, blessings to you. All right. Oh, here's the rest of your gift. I'm sorry. Don't run off yet. Yeah, there's some other things in here too. Nice book and things. Appreciate it. All right, blessings to you. Okay, we'll carry on with the church service now. All right, now time for our children's story, and I can't wait for the time when we can... Uh, Hand those dollar bills to our kids. I love to see their smiling faces. Uh, Jerry Howard is going to give our children's story this morning. We come up. There he is. There you go.
Good morning, boys and girls. We have a lot of you here today. This morning I wanted to tell you a story about salad dressing. Sometimes your mom and dads tell you things to do, like look both ways before you cross the street, pick up your toys before you go to bed, don't run down the stairs, they tell you these things because they love you and they want you to be safe. And you don't pick your toys up, you might get up in the middle of the night and step on one and hurt your foot. If you run down the stairs, you might fall and hurt yourself. You put a coat on before you go outside to keep you warm and safe. When I was a little boy, just about you guys' age, my mom let us play outside. We'd just be playing in the yard, riding our bicycles and stuff. My mom would open the door. She'd say, come inside and wash your hands. It's time to eat. I always loved that time of the day because my mom was a very good cook. We'd wash our hands and set up at the table. She would make mashed potatoes and green beans and corn and some homemade bread. And she'd put a little lettuce on the side of our plate. And she'd put some little tomato on it, maybe a little cheese and some olives. And we would eat our food. One day I noticed in the center of the table a bottle like this. And I hadn't seen that bottle before. And so I saw my dad pick it up and he took the lid off and he poured some on his salad, and he put it back on the table. And my mom reached for it, and she picked it up, and she put some on her salad. So I thought, well, I'll have some too. And I reached for it, and my mom goes, no, no, don't get that. You won't like it. It's hot and spicy. So I didn't get any, and I thought, well, that's odd. Why does she like it, and we don't? <laughs> so I went ahead, and... We ate our meal, and we went and washed our hands and played, and a couple days later we had a dinner, and Mom had the little salads, and Dad got the salad dressing. He poured it on his salad, and Mom got it. She poured it on there, and I didn't get it because she had told me not to, but I next day we were in the kitchen. I was putting some in the refrigerator, and I saw that bottle sitting there. I thought... Boy, that stuff looks just like my favorite Jello, which is orange. I bet you I would really like that salad dressing. And I liked orange juice. So I thought, man, I ought to have some of that. So the next day, my dad was at work, and it was just my mom and my sister and me at the table, and mother made spaghetti, and that was my favorite meal. On the side of the plate, she'd put our little salad with the lettuce and tomato, and in the middle of the table was the salad dressing. And so we said our blessing. And just about that time, ding dong, the doorbell rang. So mom got up and she walked down the hallway and she went to the front door. I thought, now's a good time to try that salad dressing. So I took the lid off and I turned it over and nothing came out. And if I leaned back a little bit, I could see my mom at the front door. So I better watch for my mom because I didn't want her to see me getting the salad dress. And I could hear her talking to the lady, and she was talking and talking. Pretty soon she said, well, thank you for coming by. You come again sometime. Well, when I looked back at my plate, I had a full plate of salad dressing. <laughs> the whole bottle was in my plate. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And my mom walked in and she goes, Jerry Wendell Howard. Well, when I heard my middle name, I knew that wasn't a good sign. She goes, why did you get that salad dressing? I told you you wouldn't like it. And because you disobeyed, now you're going to have to eat every single bite of it. So I thought, well, that's no problem. It'll be like my Jello." So I got a big spoonful of that, and I put it in my mouth, and I swallowed it. And you know what? My mom was right. I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. It got to my stomach. It turned around and came right back up. 
So the lesson I learned from that is when my mom tells me to do something, my dad or Jesus, we need to do what they say because they know what is best for us. Who would like to say the uh, prayer for us? One of you want to say a prayer? Okay. Come here. You can say it. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Help it to be a good day today. Dear Jesus, amen. Time to go before the Lord together. Um, I always like to uh, read a text before I, I pray, and <clears throat> I'd like to read Psalm seventy-seven, thirteen. Um, we're, we're in the young adults. We're studying the sanctuary, and um, I want to point your eyes to it. It says, "Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God?" And um, I. I'd like to include in my prayer this morning, if, if, um, if you will, if any of you are struggling with prayer um, in your personal devotions, I want to include you in this prayer this morning. I believe Satan is attacking uh, anything he can that will disconnect us from the Lord. And uh, I believe prayer is the, the key in the hand of faith, but it's, it's our key to salvation, to being connected to God. So. If you want to be included in that prayer, just uh, say amen in your heart or say you agree. And, uh, and I pray that you uh, kneel with me now as we go before the Lord. great you are, Lord. We praise you this morning from the bottom of our hearts. It's been a long week, Lord, and we pray that we might come into your presence this morning together as a congregation. We pray that you would look into our hearts, Lord, and see what is there. And I pray that you would give us the strength to separate the sin from our hearts, Lord to draw closer to you, that nothing would separate us from you. This morning, Lord, a special prayer for the congregation of whoever agreed this morning, Lord. We know that connection with you is a connection with eternity. And this morning, I know that there are in this body of believers, Lord, that there are people where Satan has attacked their prayer life, put things in its place, um, things that interfere, Lord, with our devotions to you. Morning and evening, I pray, Lord, a special blessing today that your Holy Spirit would be poured out to give them that connection that's needed to draw closer to our Savior this morning. And thank you for hearing our prayer, Lord. This morning, we have sung praises to you because you're worthy to be praised. You're our creator, our sustainer our Jehovah Jireh you provide everything we need and we pray Lord that our dependence would become less on self and more on you day by day as we see your coming getting nearer and nearer Lord I pray for those who are struggling with sin circular sins that just keep coming around Lord I pray that you would give them a special vision that they would see how Satan works in our life. And we thank you for your mercy that you continue to tend with us, Lord, that you, you, you're there for us each time that sin, that temptation comes around. I thank you, Lord, for your plan 
to save us from sin. This morning, I pray that you would bless this congregation, Lord, that you would bless our ears as we hear your word presented. Bless our pastor, Lord, that you have sent to us. We're so thankful, Lord, that you've sent him to us to, that we might hear the word of God clearly. And I pray that our hearts would be prepared, that our soil, Lord, would be fertile and not rocky and thorny as your word depicts. We thank you, Lord, for your grace that gives us uh, mercy after mercy. I want to pray for those who have gone through illnesses and are going through right now, Lord. I have several in my mind, and, and I know there are others here. We pray, Lord, that you would lift them up. We see that your testimony of when you walked this earth, dear Jesus, that it was in your character to heal wherever you went. It is in your will to heal people. And so we lift them up, Lord. Everyone that's, that has someone on their, their heart this morning, please draw near to them and touch them with that healing touch, we pray. Or just speak the word. And that our faith, Lord, we would be made whole. I thank you for hearing our prayer this morning. We thank you for this place of worship. We thank you for the freedom we still have today, Lord. The precious freedom we have to meet together freely. We thank you for all these things. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Uh, the song I'm going to be singing is uh, the words are actually found in Scripture. And so if you would like, um, I invite you to open your Bibles to Second Chronicles chapter 7, 14. And I, I pray that the message of the word will be a blessing to you. are called by my name shall humble themselves shall humble themselves and pray if my people which are called my face and turn from the wicked ways then will I hear from heaven then will I hear from heaven then will Which are called by my name shall humble themselves, shall humble themselves and pray. I will forgive their sin, I will forgive their sin. people 
which are called by my name shall humble themselves shall humble themselves shall humble themselves and Amen. Thank you, Dino. And I ask you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 23 through 25. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 23 through 25. Seems like a topic of the day is prayer. It reads, verse 23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. May God bless us as we continue in the reading of his word. It is interesting. Uh, we did not coordinate in any way today with the theme. We didn't, but yet it seems to be what God wants us to hear about today. And uh, it's true I'm going to speak uh, from God's Word about prayer. The one thing I do want to make sure that I don't want people to think that I'm setting myself up as an expert in prayer, but I do know that uh, God does hear and answers according to His will. And we're going to get, dig into that from the Bible perspective today. And you notice I titled it Pray to Be, um, because most of the times we pray for stuff. And we'll get into that as we open up His Word. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, it is a privilege to come to you today to speak to the creator of the universe, He who created us. Lord, I ask that as today we open up your Word now, that your sweet spirit will speak to our hearts and we'll be encouraged in our walk. And in Jesus' name, I ask amen. You will notice that, uh, as I mentioned already, how many times, if you think about it, we're going to be a little honestly thing here, that you ever pray to be like Jesus, pray to do his will, as more than we pray for, oh, I usually get this, pastor, Will you pray for me? I need a job. I'm not saying anything's wrong with that. Pastor, will you pray for me for healing? I need a companion. I need a car. Lord, please get me out of this situation. How many times have you had those prayers? Right? We pray often. That's our prayer, those kind of things. Like, Lord, help me. Not that God doesn't want to hear that. But I want you to notice as we go through the, the to kind of let it sink in a little bit today, as we go through looking at the Bible, the model prayer is not so much to get as it is to be, right? Because the Bible teaches very clearly, the theme of it is, and this is one of the things I really, I was sitting back here as we were going on today, and it struck me, and I was thinking about it, because we hear a lot, and I see all these little youngins up here, and we hear a lot in the world today. Uh, Ingo kind of mentioned it up here a while ago as well. We try to reach the secular mind. We try to reach the children. We try to reach, there's always these classes that we're trying to reach, you know, some group, Try to reach this group or that group. And I've noticed that the human heart, no matter how young or old, when when you really think things through a little bit, there's this one cry, how do I live forever? How do I get to God's kingdom? How can I be there with Jesus? If you you miss that, I don't know if you know this or not, but you kind of miss everything. Like if you're not there, uh, who cares if you were at church every week? If you're not there, who cares how much money you gave? Or by the way, you have a building fund going on. (laughs) If you miss that, You've missed, not the building fund, but if you miss heaven, you've missed everything. They'll have a great place there. And so I was thinking along those lines a little bit today, and I like it that no matter how old or young you are, the Word of God can speak to you. We don't have to tailor it to old or young or or its particular race. The human heart is the same. The cry is the same. That's kind of a nice thing to think about. 
So anyway, I'm going to start with a story in the Bible about a prayer that did not get answered. <clears throat> How many times, have you, I mean, I, I just think about it in your life and think about um, people you've known where they'll say, you know, why did God not answer my prayer? Why did he let this happen? You've heard that before, right? Maybe you've even said it. God, how can you let this happen? I've done this, I've done that, and I've prayed to you, and you did not answer my prayer. How can you do this, right? And so I'm going to put something out at the beginning here before I read this story in the Bible, and it is this. Sometimes what you're praying for is in complete contradiction to something you prayed for maybe even years earlier, and it, what is God to do? It, it, you realize that oftentimes we'll pray for something that, it, that uh, if God answers that prayer, he's contradicting a prayer that you asked before. I can give you a good example that, and one that really means a lot. How many people here, without a show of hands, just how many people here, think about it, have prayed that your kids be in the kingdom of God? Right? You've prayed that prayer, haven't you? I want my kids there. Now, let's suppose there was a story, a situation where one of your children, young, was deathly ill in the hospital dying, and you pray, God, heal my son or heal my daughter, please heal them, and believing that God was going to heal them, and the kid dies. And they turn away from God, the parents or family or other turn away from God, how can you let something like this happen? And then God was in a dilemma because you had prayed earlier that the kid would be saved, and perhaps in that moment, that child was in a saved condition, was going to be in the kingdom of God for all eternity. And the Lord knows the end from the beginning, knows, knows that if he heals that child, he may make really bad decisions later and not be in the kingdom. Do you understand God's dilemma? There's a story in the Bible about that actually happening. Remember Hezekiah, who prayed for, wasn't Hezekiah prayed for another 20, uh, prayed for more time, and God gave him 15 years, right? And then he had a child who was a tyrant, right? And caused multitudes to be lost in that time span that he had extra time. I want to read you one about a dad who was pleading for, the, for, the, for his son's life to be spared, and God didn't spare it. There's a story in the Bible, true story, about a fellow by the name of David. He was a king. And if you remember the story probably quite well, he was hanging out on the balcony one day, and he saw his neighbor's wife out there, and she was looking good. And so he invited her over for dinner. And one thing led to another. Paraphrasing the story a little bit, it was somebody else's wife. It was Uriah's wife. And so, you know, he had the, sto you know, the story goes, he tried to cover up his sin, so he has Uriah killed. I often think how many times you could not make the stories of the Bible into a movie and let your children watch it. And so anyway, uh, Nathan, the prophet, came to David after this had taken place. I'm going to pick it up in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 13. I really think this is a good story to lead in with for us, for a thought process here about God answering prayer. So Nathaniel tells the story about the guy that had all the sheep he ever wanted, all the money he ever wanted. When he had a friend come by, he stole the sheep from, or took the sheep from one of his poor neighbors, the only one they had, one they cherished like a child, butchered it and ate it. And David, when he heard about this story, he was furious. And then you remember Nathan tells David, you're the man. You, you, told, you stole Uriah's wife. So David says this now in verse 13. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Do you remember a story also, by the way, just as a little note here about King Saul, whenever Samuel come to him and told him, laid his sin before him, and he said, I've sinned against the Lord. Because the people done this or that or the other, right? Justifying himself. I want you to notice David's words. I've sinned against the Lord. No excuses. It's on me. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord has put away your sin and you are not going to die. In other words, you're forgiven. You're not going to die for what you did. I mean, ultimately you're going to die, but you're not going to die for what you did here. God's forgiven you. Can you imagine that? <laughs> I, I would venture to say that most of us here, if we were living in that time frame, would not want David to be forgiven. Right? How dare he do something like that? Especially if you're buddies with Uriah. How would you feel? Right? No, how can he be forgiven? I appreciate the fact there was no delay here. You're forgiven. Right? I, I was listening to the same story, uh, and uh, uh, it was Pastor Doug one time talking about this same story, and he says, well, he should have at least, maybe in our view, given David like 50 days before he forgive him. 
You know, something ought to be. They had to have 50 days of unforgiveness or something. But isn't it powerful no matter how bad your sin is? That prayer is always answered immediately when you repent. Immediately. It goes on. Howbeit, because this deed you have done has called, caused great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Do you understand that, how that play, has played down through history, by the way? All through history, this deed that David did has given many multitudes great occasion to blaspheme against the Lord. How many times have you ever heard somebody justify their sin because look what David did? Right? And again, we're going to point out here that even though uh, David done this terrible deed, and you want to justify your sin by saying, look what David did, why don't you go ahead and repent as David as well? But it goes on and says, the child also that is born unto you will surely die. Nathan departed out of his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and he was very sick. What a sad story that is. Does that sound unfair that this child would have to suffer? Because what David did. This child has to die before, because of what David did. And there's great parallels here, by the way, because if you, if you fall in line and, and look what's happening here, wasn't it the son of David that was born into this world that died who did nothing wrong? Here, what, the, a child of David, a son of David, is going to die and did nothing wrong. Sounds really unfair, doesn't it? I'm convinced that this child, whose name is not in the Bible, will one day be in the kingdom of God. What a wonderful day that will be. So David, therefore, besought God for the child. So David began to pray, beseeching God for the child, and it says David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. Like he went and fasted and laid, in, laid it down, face down all night, praying for this child to be healed. Why not, God? As a matter of fact, you're a merciful and loving God. Why don't you heal this child? I've repented for my sin. I mean, wasn't there some crazy um, people that, uh, in Nineveh that were really bad to one another that God sent a prophet to say, hey, you're all going to die because of your evilness. They repented and God forgave them and didn't destroy their city. Why can't he do it for somebody like David who is a man after God's own heart, right? I can picture David, by the way, thinking along these lines. I can picture him knowing the fact that David went to pray here tells you that he knew God. I mean, he really believed that God may change his mind. And it goes on, David, therefore we saw it, and then verse 17, the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither would he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day, the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell that the child was dead, for they said, behold, while the child was yet alive. We spoke unto him, and he would not hearken to our voice. How will he then vex himself, perplexed, be distressed, vexed, if we tell him that the child is dead? <laughs> They're like, the way he's been acting, and what, the, the prayer that he's praying, and, and the, how humble he is, and laying on the face of the earth, fasting, not eating, what he's putting himself through to try to save this child. If we tell him it's dead, who knows how he may act? So they're off to the side whispering. And so it said, David perceived that the child was dead as his servants were over there whispering in verse 19. Therefore, David said to his servants, is the child dead? They said, he's dead. David rose up from the earth, washed his face, washed himself, anointed himself, changed his clothes, went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he came to his own house and when they required, and, and then he required, um, I'm sorry, and when he required, they set bread before him and he did eat. Isn't it fascinating that David's prayer was not answered, but the first thing he did after his prayer was not answered was go worship God? A lot of lessons here. Because God was still there. God was listening, and God knows what's best. Hard to accept sometimes. So his servant said to him, What's this thing that you've done? Thou did fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, you didn't rise and eat bread. After, after the child was dead, you rose up and ate bread. And he said, well, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me and the child might live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? And then he says, I will go to him. He will not return to me. I think here is very powerful. David understood something. God did answer his prayer. 
God did hear his prayer. God's answer was no for this child to live, but he heard him. I know it's hard for us to understand, especially when we're in the midst of trouble ourselves, but you know, sometimes God actually wants to put you through something where he can put you in a best place to save you, or maybe even put you in a place to save someone else. Sometimes, sometimes it's God's will that we suffer. Praying to get out of suffering, praying not to suffer, should be followed up with God. Nevertheless, your will be done. That's easy to say, but harder to mean. So what's God to do? What's God to do for us today when we think he's not listening when things are all going wrong and we're praying that they go right. How's he to answer that? I want to encourage you today as we go through the rest of this not to think or, or, not, not to, or, or to come to the place where we don't think about if things are going wrong, God must not be with us or not answering our prayers. I know it's tempting. I'm going to go to our scripture reading then 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23. And this tells us a whole lot about praying um, here, because I want you to notice the wording and how it's done. Paul writing to the church of Thessalonica, and he says in verse 23 of 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, and, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. The goal here, complete sanctification. And I pray God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That tells you the theme of Paul's prayers as well. And incidentally, praying those prayers, if we will allow God to work, he'll always answer them on the positive side. Did you know God wants you to save, be saved greater than you want to be saved? It's true. <clears throat> he knows more about what's there than you do, right? You have no idea what you're missing if you miss out. If you miss out on eternal life. But he goes on and says, Faithful is he that calls you who also do it. And then he says, brethren, pray for us. I like it that God here simply, or Paul here simply says, my prayer for you is not that you have an easy time, not that things always go your way, but that ultimately that you're in God's kingdom. By the way, if you're sanctified holy and you're blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, guess where you get to spend eternity? This was David's prayer. And I want to give you another back to the Old Testament for a moment. This is about finding ourselves in a bad situation. And it turns out God is there all along. And I, I actually referenced this, this story in Jeremiah chapter 29 last Sabbath in the sermon. Reference this story. We're going to reference it again because there's, there's a lot of praying going on here. God is actually telling you to pray for something that you would never pray for. All right? Have you ever thought about praying for something that God would have you pray for, but it's not what, you're, not what your heart is set on necessarily, right? Follow this. Jeremiah 29.1, it says, These are the words of the letter of Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders which were carried away captives. And to the priests and to the prophets and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. So in a quick overview here, does everyone know why God's people were all taken captive? These people were all taken captive away to Babylon, why that happened? Because they were acting pretty much like we do as a nation in a world today. They have just pretty much, for, for many folks, um, wanted things their own way. They were worshiping the way they thought they should worship. They were doing the things they wanted to do and was ignoring what God was sending through his word, through his prophets by his word. Like he would send prophets and, and, and he had, they had God's word. They weren't following it. They thought they were perfectly justified in the way they were doing things. And so God had finally said, okay, you're going away captive. And he sends them away captive to Babylon. So... As God's people, you would think that with the things that are going on, what should you do? Pray to God that he would return us back home. That would be the goal, wouldn't it? If God's merciful and loving, why would he put us in this situation was the thought on people's minds. Now, I'm going to jump down to verse 4. It goes through some king talk and queen talk there in verses 2 and 3. Verse 4, thus says the Lord of hosts, Jeremiah says, the God of Israel unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away. What is God's will in this scenario? For you to have a bad day. 
If you're in this scenario and part of God's people, God's will is for you to have a very bad day, isn't it? Like, how would, why would God have a will that I'd have a bad day? And we'll see here, and the answer as we move through this, God sometimes wills for you to have a bad day, week, month, year, like last year, right, for some of us. Last year was really good for me. I enjoyed it. I mean, like, except for the whole pandemic thing. But God has blessed abundantly, right? Sometimes, as in this case, it's God's will for you to have a bad time. That's, that's hard to say because people are already, like, debating me right now. I can feel it in your Marines. But he brought them into this bad situation in order to save them. And multitudes throughout history, follow how this goes on. He says, I have caused you to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take wives and beget sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands. That they may bear sons and daughters. And that they may increase there and not diminish. And seek the peace of the city, whether I've caused you to be carried away captives. God is telling his people to seek for the peace of Babylon, where you're captive. Now listen to the next part. Pray to the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof you shall have peace. God is telling his people to pray for Babylon to have peace. Now is that not contradictory to anything you've ever been taught in the Bible ever? Anything you've ever thought of that God would actually be telling his people to pray for the peace? Pray for something like that? I can't pray for that. I'm sorry. I can't pray for that God, right? Wouldn't you feel that way? These are your enemies. These people hate you. But God says, look, you, because of your sins and because of what you've done, you're, you're going to receive this punishment. You're going to go there. If there's peace in Babylon, you'll have peace. That's confusing, isn't it? He's not telling them in any way to compromise with Babylon. He's not telling them in any way to accept the teachings of Babylon and follow their ideas or their thoughts. But he's just saying, look, pray that they have peace in Babylon. It goes on, for thus says the Lord of hosts. Isn't that funny, though? Have you ever considered that? Pray for Babylon. All right. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets or your diviners that are in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to the dreams which you have caused them to dream, for they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord of hosts, after 70 years be accomplished in Babylon, I will visit you, perform my good word toward you, and cause you to return to this place. It's God's will for you, to, guys, for you folks to have a, a bad 70 years, to be in captivity, to be in Babylon. That's what he says. Verse 11. I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give an expected end. I like the wording there, to give an expected end. In other words, the end goal, if you will, or the end game, how it's all going to ultimately turn out. Sometimes you may have just a terrible life. If you think about it, 70 years, if you were born in the first year of the captivity of Babylon, you probably, and you lived the ripe old age of 70, your whole life was in captivity and bondage. And, and uh, why would that be God's will? Well, we'll find out. He said, then you'll call upon me. And you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. He says, after the 70 years time frame, after, after, you can pray for the entire 70 years to be delivered. You can pray every day to be delivered. You can be on your face, fasting and weeping and praying every day to be delivered. But it's not going to happen for 70 years. It's God's will. But I will hear and will answer. Notice the timing here. Sometimes if our prayer isn't answered quickly, God, how can you let this happen? How would you like the prayer to have to go on for 70 years? Sometimes folks have prayed for things like that for a long time. It says, he shall seek me and find me when you search me with all of your heart, and I will be found of you, says the Lord. I will turn your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations, from, the, from all the places whither I have driven you, says the Lord. I will bring you again to this place whence I caused you to be carried away captive, because you have said the Lord has raised up, prop, raised up prophets in Babylon. Know that thus says the Lord of the king that sits on the throne of David and all the people that dwells in the city and of your brethren that are not gone forth Unto captivity. Thus says the Lord of hosts Behold, I will send upon them sword and famine and pestilence. So those that didn't get carried away, bad day for them too. And I will make them like vile figs that cannot be eaten so, because they're so evil. 
And I will persecute them with the sword and with famine and with pestilence. I will deliver them to be removed from the kingdoms of the earth to be a curse and abomination and a hissing and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them. I read that for a really important reason, I think, is no matter how much praying they're doing now, this is what they're going through because of the way they live their life. It is um, a thought for us. Um, many times we spend our biggest time praying when we're in the crisis when we should have been praying before the crisis and doing God's will then not uh, trying to be condescending condemning whenever someone comes pastor I'm in this situation please help me out please pray for us you know pray pray this this and and you can look oftentimes and say you know for the last 10 years this has been going on or that's been going on You've been given counsel. We've been pleading. You know, someone's pled with you. You know, all of us have times that we really mess things up, I guess. But I want you to notice here that most of our praying is when we're in crisis. I want to encourage you to be praying before then. I really, I mean, we really understand if you read that, read that God doesn't change. How he dealt with them, he deals with us. If we're on our face, if we're repenting and turning to him now before the crisis the crisis may be easier then it says this it says I'm among the nations where I've driven them then verse 19 because they have not hearkened to my words says the Lord what was the problem with the children of Israel being carried away to, captive to Babylon why are they now praying to be delivered they hadn't listened all along didn't listen to God's word. But I want to show you something here. Think about if our group here were all carried away captive and we're in prison now. And you're like, but I was, but this isn't fair. It isn't right, right? You can imagine the thought of many people as they were carried away to Babylon. Were there faithful people carried away to Babylon? Oh, yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, here's what God ends up doing with when. At the time, you would be praying, God, how can you let this happen to me? God, this is terrible. This is rotten. You're, you, you're not hearing me. You're not answering my prayers. How can this be? And at the same time, God brings glory to himself. He saves Nebuchadnezzar. He raises up Daniel, saves multitudes, who knows how many millions in the future because of what Daniel writings had to say and in the, the book that was written from there. He humbled his people, taught them to believe and to trust his word. Perhaps the prayer may be for us, instead of praying to be delivered, is to pray to endure even under the rebuke of the Lord. I think it's fascinating when you look, like when we're in the middle of a situation, in the middle of something terrible happening, for every one of us, and we're praying to be delivered from it, and we're not delivered, and we start blaming God, perhaps God has just used that to save someone else. Could you imagine Daniel? Faithful Daniel didn't do anything wrong. We know he loved the Lord so much he was even serving God when he took, got taken away captive. This is unfair, O oh Lord. Never heard him say that. I wonder if it had at least crossed his mind. But God used him. God answered these prayers. Even under the rebuking of the Lord, God is answering your prayers. Uh, it makes me think of the Hebrews 12 text, Hebrews 12, 5. It says, Hebrews 12, 5, ye have, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, he scourges every, every son whom he receives. If you endure the chastening, God deals with you as a son, for what son is he whom your father does not chasten? And but if you would be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. God says sometimes you have to go through the chastisement that the Lord has put you under, accept it, and be, in my view here, grateful for it. You're his son, you're one of his. Sometimes the prayers don't seem to be answered, but God answers them every time. At the time when we're asking God, how can you allow this to happen to me? His answer is, because I love you. God, get me out of this situation. 
he may say, it's not for your best good. You can imagine the people, the children of Israel, asking, why are you letting this happen to me? Praying for immediate deliverance. But God knows what is best for you and others for all eternity. Here's the question. Can we trust him to do what's right? Uh, For sure we can. You remember the model prayer Jesus gave us, right? We pray it often, but I don't think we always mean it when we pray it. Because it says something along these lines. Thy will be done. When's the last time when you think about it, when you're in a terrible strait, you're praying for God to get you out of it, but nevertheless, Lord, what you want, your will be done. The Bible actually says in Luke 11, I'm speaking of that, Luke 11, 1, it says it came to pass when he was praying in a certain place, when he stopped, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said unto them, when you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As in heaven, so in earth. And then give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, that we may also forgive everyone indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Uh, you know, it's powerful about that. It covers everything. That short prayer, obviously it's, it's not like you don't pray those exact words every time, but it covers every, every situation. It starts off giving God glory, praising him. Then asking him that he would see to it that what his will for my life is will be done and one day his kingdom will come. It covers everything. Do you ever think about praying when you're praying and, and you're in a de- terrible situation? Lord, just whatever you want, that's what I want. And mean it? It's easy to say right now because I'm not in a situation. Sometimes we think our prayers aren't being answered because we didn't get what we wanted. But we're to pray for his will. And so, you know, when our will is in line with his will, your prayer is answered 100% of the time. The Bible teaches that we should be praying. Jesus, is pray- after that model prayer, he goes on just a little bit below that, and he starts telling about, uh, in, another, in a parable form, he said unto them, which of you shall have a friend? And you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, give me three loaves. Uh, for a friend is an, on a journey, and he's come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, don't bother me. The door is shut. My children are in bed, and I can't rise up to give you. I say unto you, though he will not rise to give, it, give him because he's a friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. That word importunity means because of his persistence, and, his, and if you want to put it in a, in a better way, because of his annoyance. Like he's coming in the middle of the night, he's pounding on the door. If you don't quieten him down uh, because he's asking, everything's going to... You know, they lived in like a community where you would have the animals all right around real close. And so, you know, if, if, he, if one kid wakes up, starts crying, and the animals wake up, the whole neighborhood wakes up, and it's not a bad time. It's a really bad time. So he says he would get up and give it to him, not because he's his friend, because he's annoying. Not that we're annoying to God. Not that we're annoying to God, but I want you to hear what he says in answer to this. As That was an illustration. He said, I say unto you, um, I'm, I'm sorry, go back to it. It says, and from within he shall answer, don't trouble me, but he does it for his importunity. And uh, verse 9, I say unto you, ask, it'll be given to you. Seek, you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened to you. For everyone that asks receives, and he that seeks finds. And to him that knocks, it will be opened. If a son will ask bread of you, that is a father, will he give him a stone? If he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If he asks of an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you were being evil, isn't it interesting, Jesus' assumption that we're always evil? Us. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? That's kind of a powerful thing there. If you consider that the idea is, Jesus is saying simply, you need to be praying for the Holy Spirit. And he's willing to give it to you. Even more than the guy's willing to get out of bed and help his friend, he says he's willing to give you the Holy Spirit. Well, contemplating that a little bit, why is that the focus? Why is that the subject? It's very simple. How many people filled with the Holy Spirit won't be in the kingdom of God? How many people filled with the Holy Spirit won't be in the kingdom of God? Everyone who's filled will be there. Jesus' goal is answering prayer is to get us in heaven. I'm going to give you an illustration. I don't know how, this is a true story, by the way. I don't know how well this plays into this. I personally think it plays into it quite well, but it gives you an idea about God's view on answering prayer. 
You want, you want to hear my, my perspective about God's view of answering prayer? Okay, here it goes. I was going to save this part for a children's story, but I'm going to tell it now. So when I was, when I was really, I would say little, I'll just say young. I think I told you some, my grandmother would take me to church, to this little Methodist church that was, there, was, there would be like four other people there. My grandmother, three little old ladies, and me. And she would drag me there once in a while growing up as a kid. Mount Zion Methodist Church, really old building. And whenever she could uh, force me to go, I would go to church with her. And one thing she would always, like they would go back and do a little, she would do a little Sunday school thing with me, right? She would try to teach me one thing, always pray, you know, just teach me to pray. Okay, I wasn't sure how things worked, but I believe there was a God, and my grandmother taught me there was, and that I needed to pray, and so I would pray. And up to about, I don't know how old I was, I was old enough to have my own fishing rod and reel and tackle box. And uh, we went on a vacation down to Florida to visit some, from some of our friends. And uh, this one guy uh, who was friends with my parents down there, every evening when he'd get home from work while we were on vacation, would take my brother and I out into a little, uh, right in the inlet there, probably the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, uh, Peace River Fishing Resort place where it was, right? He would take us out fishing every, every evening when he got home from work. It was the best vacation ever. I loved to fish. My parents didn't care for fishing. I loved it, and I cherished my little rod and reel because they weren't going to buy me another one. My stuff was, I cherished my, stuff, my things there, right? I loved fishing. So we would put shrimp on the hook. We'd throw it out there, and we would catch catfish and stuff all evening and had a wonderful time. And um, so it was toward the end of our vacation. It was the last night we were going to be fishing. And <clears throat> for the first time since I've been fishing, I set my rod and reel down. So I put the bait on, cast it out, set my rod and reel down. And I turn, I turn back, and that rod goes, pew, pew, gone. Went out in the water, it was gone. And this is a big, big area, current flowing through there and things. And uh, so the, it immediately sunk into me that I don't have a rod and reel anymore. And I was toward the front of the boat, and as a kid, you know, I'm going to start crying a little bit. You know, I don't want to see me crying. And it come to my mind to pray. And it's a true story. So I was like, I don't remember how the prayer was. I had to say it really quiet because I didn't want them to hear me. But it was something along the lines of, God, I, I need my rod and reel. I don't have one, you know. Please, how can I get a rod and reel? I, don't know. I was praying to God for my rod and reel. It was gone. And um, my brother, we were getting ready to go in anyway. My brother had his line out. You know, he's fishing rod and he's fishing. He catches hooks of fish. Oh, I got one. He's reeling, he's reeling, reeling. He's fighting his fish. He, bro- he reels his fish in, and in this fish's mouth, coming out of both sides, is string, fishing string. And if you could see the size of the place we were at, I mean, it's huge, right? So I grabbed the fishing line, we pulled up. It was my rod and reel. And I really didn't. had a big fish on the other end of it, right? The fish had jerked it in the water, and then it swam around, and it said to other fish, hey, hey, I don't know why we're doing this, but somehow, apparently, God wants me to come over here and talk to you for a minute. I don't know how it worked out. But I got my rod and reel back. Now, to me, that, that like, inside, in my mind, in the back of my mind, didn't, didn't produce fruit right away, right? But in my mind, God answers prayer. It's amazing to me. Now, here, listen to this. Years later, like about, to about eight years ago, I was, um, my buddy, my friend, close friend Rick Couch had uh, let me have his boat, use his boat, and I had all, you know, he has expensive stuff, nice things, rod and rails, and I had my brother with me on vacation while I was living in Florida, and uh, so I was, took off in the boat, and I went around this corner, and I hadn't strapped the rod and rails down in the boat. Now, this boat was fast, and one of the rods went, and it was like $300 rod and reel, and uh, I was like, oh, man. So uh, we went back. We looked, looked, looked. You know, on the, we can't find it, can't find it. So I was like, I'll pray about it. I never found the rod and reel. <laughs> so why did God not answer that prayer? I was just as sincere. This time I actually believed in him. I mean, like I believed he would answer, right? And, and you know, here's, here's the thing I want to I kind of point out with this. I'm convinced, I'm convinced, and this is my theology on, on, like, from a biblical perspective too, I think. God didn't answer that prayer for multiple reasons. One is, I already had all the evidence. He'd give me everything he'd, I needed to believe in him. The prior one, the first one, he was showing me that I could trust him, I could believe in him, right? He, he, he's always working because his goal isn't to fix by my rod and reel. His goal is to get me into the kingdom of God, right? And I mean, if, if I'd have found the other rod and reel, it'd been great, it'd been an even better story. But the same point is, I didn't need that prayer answered. As a matter of fact, maybe God allowed, that to, allowed me to have to not find that rod and reel, so then I would have to answer to my friend Rick, and then 
realize I'd be more responsible in strapping my rod and reels down from now on. Anyway, I thought it was a good story, but it's a true story. And uh, it's powerful, though, by the way. Have you ever heard of these sto- stories and, at, at times about little kids' prayers being answered? I hear that so often. Like, Jesus talks about the faith of these kids, you know, and I realize that I think that God does that because he's at an early age wanting to show them that he's there. He still wants us to see he's there, too. We have much evidence by this time, by the time you get old like me. So I'm going to kind of wrap things up a little bit, uh, sort of. Sometimes our prayers aren't answered because we're not asking for the right reason. Let's follow this. Go to James chapter 4. James chapter 4 and verse 1. The Bible says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Who's he talking about? The you. You know, church folk. Why do you have wars and fightings among you? <laughs> Believers, why is, there, why is there fighting among us, right? Come they not thence, hence, even of your own lusts that you wore in your members? You lust and you do not have. You kill, you desire to have. You cannot obtain. You fight and you war. And you have not because you do not ask. You ask and then you don't receive. Because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. Isn't that a powerful statement? Sometimes our prayers are not answered because we're asking just nothing more than to benefit us. I think there's a couple of things we can pick out of if we read the Bible through and, and, and apply it to practical living when it comes to prayer, when it comes to God. If your concern is helping others, God will answer those prayers. God will answer prayers for help yourself too. Don't get me wrong. He will do that. But it has to be for the right reason. And sometimes he says no or doesn't answer the way you think he should because we all need to learn lessons. He finishes up here with you adulterers and adulteresses, speaking of us. Know you not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore is a friend of the world is God's enemy. If you're praying and asking God for things, for your temporary only, for this world, to have some kind of special benefit, to get ahead, to make things better and easier for you here, oftentimes he's not going to answer that because, to be honest with you, if you're friends with the world, you're enemy with God, how many enemy of God will be in the kingdom of God? The prayer that God always answers is the ones that will get you and others into his kingdom. That's why when you're filled with the Spirit of God, you're seeking for him, your prayers are always answered. Because there's only one prayer that's really on our hearts when we realize what we're, li- what we're living for, and that's eternal life. So how often do you pray to be like Jesus? How often do you pray to make you like him? How often do we pray for the Holy Spirit to fill our lives as compared to praying for things that we want, need, or feel like we need? I love it in Romans 14, 17. It says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. In other words, the kingdom of God is not about the stuff you have, but about righteousness and peace and the Holy Holy Spirit. Don't pray about the stuff that you want and want to have. I mean, that's not the focus of our prayer, but about eternal life, about righteousness, peace, and the Holy Ghost, he says. It goes along with what Jesus says in Luke 12, 29, when he says, Seek ye not what you shall eat or what you shall drink, neither be of a doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek, and your Father knows that you have need of these things. What's he saying? Don't be praying for, don't be longing for the things of this world. I know you need these things. Don't make that the center of your life. Don't make that the focus of your prayer life. Don't make that the focus of what you're, what you're longing for. Make eternity your focus. Because he says, but rather seek the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. How do we do that? How do we seek the kingdom of God and then have all these things added unto us seeking the kingdom of God is simply praying to be to be like rather than praying for the stuff that I want he always answers those prayers fear not little flock it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom praying to be not to get and Jesus by the way here says you get it anyway did you notice what he said by the way if your prayer and your, and your focus is on the kingdom of God you get the stuff you need anyway 
Can you imagine the frustration in God? Why they spend so much time worrying about these things on the, on, on the earth when I've already supplied that for them? Why don't they focus on heaven? Can you imagine how angels may be frustrated with us at times? Finding that you're content with whatever you have when heaven is your prayer. So I guess I want to appeal to us today. Appeal to keep our mind, our thoughts, our prayers on the goal of heaven. Our prayer on being like Jesus so that we can be there. Not saying we don't need to be praying for the things that we need. God never condemns that and in any way condemns that. But what he does say is our focus and our goal needs not be on the things of this world, but on the earth, well, on the world to come. Jesus' goal is for us to be in his kingdom. I'm convinced that when we're filled with his spirit, when we pray as he would have us pray, then our prayers are always answered and lined up with his will. I'm going to finish with us. This last story here in Matthew 26, verse 39 to 42, and it's Jesus. He's getting ready to go lay down his life so that you and I can have eternal life. Ever consider this? If you were the night before the day you die, what would be your prayer? Would it be for others or yourself? It's kind of a thought for Jesus here, but I want you to notice his focus and his goal he says, he went a little farther, he fell on his face, and he prayed, saying, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What's he saying? Lord, the situation that I find myself in, I don't want to go through. Have you ever been in that situation? I don't want to go through this. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Was it Jesus' will at this time to go through the suffering that he was getting ready to go through? No. Could he have prayed and got out of it? Yeah. But what a model prayer this is. Lord, I don't want to go through the things I have to go through. But if the things I go through is going to bring me to your kingdom and others, then let's do it. Your will be done. So he came to his disciples and he found them asleep and he said to Peter, "What could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation." Peter, watch and pray. To all of us, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Pausing there, what is Jesus' goal for Peter? If Peter enters into temptation and he stumbles and he falls and he ultimately doesn't make it, where is he going to spend it? Where, what, what's the eternity look like for him, right? Jesus' goal, even for Peter, in the midst of his suffering, was for Peter to be saved. He says, the spirit indeed is willing, the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed and saying, oh, Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, your will be done. With all my <laughs> prayer expertise, I want to share this. Make it your top prayer that even if we have to go through terrible times, that his will will be done. Amen. Because the Bible tells us that God's will is not that one of us would perish. He knows each one of us individually, not one of us would perish. But all would come through repentance, that all of us would make it to his kingdom. Amen. We know his will is to save us. Every other prayer has this as his first consideration. So in your prayer life, it's kind of simplistic, but in your prayer life, time you spend praying, I know the idea, the thought is to pray, don't let this happen, don't let this happen, Lord, keep me safe, watch over my children, I pray those prayers. But if those prayers aren't answered the way we want, if you've prayed that God will inter intercede for our children, intercede for others, I'm guessing and believing, fully believing, whether it's our children, our parents, or others, God's working out to try to save them the best he can. Amen. He can't force their will. 
but he was willing to answer their prayer that brings people to his kingdom. Will you pray for that? Pray for one another's salvation. No matter what we have to go through here. Man, just think, we're in March of this year already. Last year at this time, things kind of fell apart for people. This year could even be a lot worse. But pray, even if it is, that ultimately God's will will be done and we can be there. Pray to be, not to get. All right, I think we should end with prayer right now. Before we have our closing hymn, I'd like to invite you to pray with us again. Father in heaven, you always answer and hear our prayers. I'm thankful for that, O Lord. And I pray today, Lord, that everyone here, everyone in the sound of my voice will, as well, will pray, will seek to be, to be like Jesus, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, pray where our prayer is that you are working in the lives of each individual and whatever it takes, O oh Lord, to save us, I pray that you will do. For our children, Lord, whatever it takes to get them into your kingdom, I pray that you intervene. Lord, we want to humble ourselves before you this day, knowing that you care for us so much and even if our lives here become a wreck, eternal life is worth it. So, Lord, we pray whatever it takes to make us as you, to fill us with your spirit, to get us in your kingdom. That's my prayer for every soul here today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, for our closing hymn, number 537. He leadeth me. Oh,
say you all sound great when you sing and i'll keep keep in mind too on our way out today we will have the ushers ushering out so in the meantime numbers chapter six says may the lord bless you and protect you may the lord smile on you and be gracious to you may the lord show you his favor and give you his peace on this sabbath